Hello everybody and welcome to Transformative vs. Derivative, an exploration of fan fiction in the age of franchise. I am your host, I go by Transformative on social media. Uh, if you guys are joining us, this is uh, my special panel I'm doing here at TrotCon Online. This is a panel that kind of is a combination of panels I've done previously uh, at many different cons over the last decade. It seems that every time I talk about uh, whether it's art history or art creation, I go into a lot of themes that go into the idea of content creation, tradition, and evolution within the art and storytelling mediums. So this panel hopefully is a way to get across all these different ideas into one uh, concisive piece. And I see someone says if I could speak louder. Yes, I could try to speak louder. All right. So if you guys don't know me, um, my background uh, as an artist, I've been doing professional art for about the last decade or so. Um, it wasn't originally what I was planning to do with my life. I actually originally went to Johns Hopkins University where I was studying genetic biology. And actually, it was at Johns Hopkins University where I started to combine my love of art and history and started to put together a bunch of different projects. One project you guys might know of is the Convention History Project, um, which you can find if you just Google Con History online. I'm currently writing a book on convention history. And with the idea of conventions, I've actually not just vended at conventions. I've traveled around the country for the last 10 years giving talks on a lot of different topics, uh, mostly relating to art, fandom, and history. And it was actually because I was studying genetic biology, I started to look at the evolution of things from the perspective of an evolutionary tree. So for example, if you ever see my graph charting the evolution of conventions across time, you can see that I kind of made it look like a evolutionary tree because that's a great way to visualize a lot of the stuff that I am planning to talk about and basically this is the stuff that I hope to address within this panel itself and last year I posted a I posted a, uh, I guess a, I posted a tweet that did get some attention it was a more theoretical tweet looking at the idea of the creativity that we have within the Rumble franchise, and specifically I was looking at the attempt to market off Watchmen, how many people have tried to take Watchmen and turn it into their own unique work, whether you have DC Comics on one end trying to pump out countless Watchmen comic books that were never approved of by the creator, the uh, TV show, the um, film adaptation, to um, other artists like Karen Gillian and Grant Morrison who are trying to take a more artistic take on Watchmen. And I, I think this is, this is a really good place to start. I know a lot of people hear me keep on mentioning Watchmen over and over again, but I, I really think it's a really good comparison because it's a it's a work that was supposed to be a riff on the Charlton comics to begin with. And the people who've been involved with this story represent this wide range of minds and creators that we see within the realm of creation. So I'm going to start talking about the different types of intents creators have when creating their own piece. But specifically, I like it because two creators I really, really respect, um, Alan Moore and Grant Morrison, um, are individuals who really see the concept of art and storytelling in a very, very profoundly different light than how most modern entertainment media and fandom see uh, art and storytelling. So I, I think this is why I keep on sticking with these two individuals, even though I do this panel at uh, furry cons, at pony cons, at anime cons. Um, these two comic book artists, I think their ideas and their works transcend just the comics medium. And uh, that's why I really want to focus on these two um, ideas. Now, going back to the idea of Watchmen, we in the My Little Pony fandom see this a lot. We, we see like My Little Pony Life, we see Equestria Girls, we've seen many, uh, we even see the IDW comics. So we've seen many 
iterations of a um, of a copyright holder trying to keep their IP uh, franchise alive, and we see this a lot with um, Watchmen as well. Watchmen has been the number one selling uh, comic book for the last 30 years since its publication has never gone out of print. And every time a new iteration of Watchmen comes out, there's always uh, articles kind of poking fun at Alan Moore because Alan Moore is just a guy who wants you just be left alone. But every time, oh, there's a new Watchmen movie, there's a new Watchmen TV series, there's a new Watchmen comic, uh, the news reporters like poking the hornet's nest and saying, hey... Why, aren't you upset? Aren't you upset that they're doing this? And yeah, I think um, Alan Moore does have a right to be upset, especially when he's bugged with this. But then the controversy also comes up, isn't Alan Moore a hypocrite? His works, um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Swamp Thing, uh, Lost Girls, almost all of his works are um, riffs or his own takes on previously existing IPs or um, works. Um, so, especially with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, where he takes characters that were made by other authors and creators and used them in his own story. So, how how is Alan Moore um, able to complain that League is, that the DC is keep on rehashing out Watchmen when he's the one who's been making a career off of these uh, copyrighted? Uh, uh, these other works. Well, um, I I really think that this comes from a, a misunderstanding. Like I said, there's very, very different intents between what a franchise holder is doing mainly monthly and keeping an IP alive versus what more and uh, his quote-unquote enemy, Grant Morrison, is doing. Now, um, let's <laughs> i like to i like to joke that they are both literal wizards in the case uh they kind of do look like dumbledore and uh, voldemort but no they are they are literal uh magicians they literally see art in a different light so um i guess just to make this a little bit easier let's just go to um one of the common arguments we see with the creation of artwork um what type of art are you making are you making art to be subversive does your art is your art a deep philosophical or political message is your art trying to you know shake the consciousness of the world is your art trying to change the social zeitgeist you know there's there's people out there who put really really artsy stuff that's supposed to be deep meta and deconstructive but you know might not reach a mass audience because it's very very niche you might have a few works like bojack that you do get a little bit larger appeal but most of the time you have creators creating art for creation's sake and it normally gets mixed reactions on the other hand you have people who want to create art for pure escapism like you know the world is already bad as it is right now it's already sucky it's already not happy um in of itself so why should we be bombarded with pain and suffering in art why don't we just have art simply there for escapism for fun storytelling and this is the other angle that uh, artists seem to take. And we, we normally see artists fall under one or two camps. Um, one of the most famous divisions between this is uh, within the speculative fiction genre. So speculative fiction at this period in time included both science fiction and fantasy. And we saw fantasy kind of shift to what we now know as epic fantasy or high fantasy because of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, like The Hobbit and his Lord of the Ring works, which kind of shift fantasy to this kind of sword and sorcery, um, escapist, uh, high fantasy route. Um, to counteract with this, um, a science fiction author named Michael Moorcock um, started a trend which has become known as new wave science fiction, and new wave science fiction was a opposite of the golden age of science fiction. While the golden age of science fiction was more of the, you know, glorious escapist space operas where mankind is out conquering the stars, a lot of new wave science fiction dealt with things like dystopians um, and, and grim futures and corporations ruling the world. So as opposed to a glorious future for mankind, it dealt with, well, if we go the trajectory that we do now, if we continue having the high market capitalism, the racism, the classism, if we keep on exploiting the environment, our resources, what type of future are we really going to inherit? So 
as opposed to the route that uh, fantasy took um, and uh, golden age science fiction took, which is supposed to be more the escapist route that, you know, turn off your brain and just enjoy. Michael Moorcock in the new wave science fiction route kind of went the more subversive route telling people, hey, you know, let's try to wake the people up and uh, change things. And we see this, how um, both uh, both these escapist and subversive ideas that both um, uh, high fantasy and new wave science fiction uh, tried to bring about um, inspired um, new waves of authors and creators that came after them. And um, from that point forward, you really can categorize authors and creators in one or two categories um star wars harry potter for example normally fall in the escapist route while something like fahrenheit 451 and uh v from vedetta would fall under the subversive route and we um we really see this um so basically i used to talk about this as escapism versus transformation um, but I think the more appropriate term is to put them in a graph where you have escapism and subversive on one side and then transformative and derivative on the other side. So, um, so examples I'd like to use, um, for example, My Little Pony, I would say is a, a G4. My Little Pony, I would say is a escapist work. It's lighthearted. It doesn't really go too deep into trying to change the, uh, the consciousness or zeitgeist of the world, but uh, how Lauren Faust approached My Little Pony is very, very unique and new. She took um, she took a lot of elements that wouldn't work. Um, a uh, an eighties toy property, a, a kid show, a kid show made specifically for girls, a uh, flash animation, and created a fantastic, unique um, world that survives. A decade later look at us we are fans of we're still fans of this work that she got started uh, over 10 years later gathered online where we have um, hundreds to thousands of people around the world um, interacting with uh, this online convention on the other hand you have works like bojack horseman for example which try to take things in the more subversive route where um yeah it, it, life sucks life doesn't have a really a happy ending life is not really a sitcom um but we we just have to go with it on the other hand you have a uh, more escapist and so you have the derivative works so works that specifically work with any specific franchise so like the Saw franchise or even star wars as the other end um the the current new star wars uh series i would say is a very very derivative uh the only one subversive new star wars i would say is the last jedi which i actually like because it did do a lot of things that were different than previous star wars works but you could see how a lot of people did not like that on the other hand you have escapist route uh things like transformers and um, you know all the Family Guy clones. So let's um, let's go a little bit further and actually break down a lot of these elements. So let's go back to that idea of rethinking, uh, relooking at art of uh, the traditions of art and how if we if we really change our perspective of what art is, um, we can now understand why people like. Alamore and Grant Morrison are trying to change uh, the perspective of how their mediums and their stories are, are seen. So both of them consider themselves as part of a magical tradition. Mo they believe in the literal concept of magic, but we, we think of magic in a very, very different state today. When we think of magic, we think of stage magicians or like uh, cultists who like to RP, uh, you know, being druids and stuff. But let's actually look at back at the shamanic traditions of where this really got started so in the uh, at the beginning um our first language evolved for consciousness so it wasn't really until we could have consciousness that we could have the concept of language um if it wasn't in it if it wasn't for language, we wouldn't be able to explain our consciousness. So first things right there, language and consciousness, very, very important. Once we are, tr once we start to try to describe our consciousness, uh, we have to find new ways to describe it. So stories were probably the first ways we expressed and shared our consciousness from one individual to the next. Um, and then cave paintings were the next form of sharing our consciousness from one form to the next. 
And because of this, we would eventually have individuals in these tribes at the dawn of human civilization that would be very, very important because these were the shamans, these were the doctors, these were the witch doctors, these were the mediums, these were the original artists, these original early shamans were the first artists, the first storytellers, the first doctors, the first scientists, the first therapists, the first psychologists, the first political chiefs. These were the ones who wield very important power in every single culture, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in with the Inuits, whether it's with the Aboriginal Australians, um, China, Tibet, Siberia, uh, South America, any country, any culture around the world you go to, they still have shamans holding an important place of power. These were the people who could conjure the spirits. These were the ones who could communicate between the two different worlds. And we think about the terms that we are using for these shamans, mediums. The word medium, someone who could communicate between the two worlds, is now where we get the word media from. So media, if we think about media, these are the people who can uh, uh, media, mass media, is where we could transmit stories through different forms. So whether it's a book, whether it's a television, whether it's a comic, that's the, uh, that's the conduit of which we are submitting these stories. Now, over time, as human civilization started to develop and grew, the role of the shaman diminished more and more. So the role of the political advisor to the chief and the king eventually became the viziers. The, uh, when the Renaissance came about and we had the luxury um, with the specialization of art of uh, labor and art now becoming a luxury so people can now focus on doing art full time instead of having to worry about farming. We see the artists kind of branch off from the shamans. Then um, at the turn of the, um, of the age of reason, the, uh, the, the power to explain the natural world to the people um, went to the scientists. And eventually, one of the last few vestiges that these um, magical shamans had, the role of um, talking about the human mind went to the psychologists and the therapists. And what was really left of these old shamanic traditions were nothing more than, um, you know, just the cloth and the veil. The people basically cosplaying and role-playing, being, uh, being druids, being witches, um, with um, basically all surface level without the understanding of what traditions they were doing. So if we really want to look at the tradition of where the shamans really went, we have to go back to the artists, the writers, the storytellers, the jesters. If we think about every single kingdom in human history who were the most important people to the king it was normally the court jester it's a court jester who could tell the king the truth in a funny manner to get to explain the truth in a way that could get across to the nobles and the masses if we think about modern the modern day we have comedians late night shows uh talk show hosts and comedians who are really the ones who get important points across about politics or how they see the world whether you agree with them or, or not you could say people like Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart are very, very successful in getting specific messages across. And then you have, um, you have the bards who are the, um, the people who would tell the stories. So well, like I was saying, these original cave paintings, these original shamans introduced with us the original language, the original art. And over time, the visual arts became more and more representational and language became more and more abstract. So um, going back to the idea of a lot of terms that we now use for both art and magic being shared with each other, it's, it's kind of true. If you think about the word for magic in almost every culture, the word for magic normally is the arts. Um, uh, or as Alan Moore would say, if you look at the word for grammar, grammar has the same roots for the word as grimoire. A grimoire is a book of spells. Uh, speaking of spell, what do you, what is it, what, what is it called when you write out a sentence? It's called spelling, uh, which if you think about spelling, you have casting a spell. A casting a spell is also an arrangement of words to get across a specific line, uh, a message. And then, like I said, the word media and medium come from the same roots. So if we now kind of take how we used to see the arts, um, more than just the um, 
it's just there as mere entertainment. And then if we completely change how we see magic, not just, you know, a magician trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat, it offers a completely new view. So a good example of this is how Alan Moore will explain how a bard is probably a more powerful magician than a witch because the most a witch can do is transform someone into a frog um, if the person annoys a witch, but a bard can write a satire so witty about a person that that person will be mocked for generations and generations to come in the form of that story being retold over and over again. And thus, if you think about it, almost every single powerful symbol in our civilization has been changed through stories and artwork. So um, in, in the world of occult magic, you have the concept of um, writing, of making sigils. Sigils are just an arrangement of symbols and words that are supposed to impart transformative meaning into the world itself. And if we think about it, modern day artwork it's not it, or basically sigils what what is a painting what is a comic if it's not an arrangement of of symbols to impart new meaning on a person um it's 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 something that both Grant Morrison and Alan Moore deeply explore in their comics, uh, specifically uh, Promethea for Alan Moore and The Invisibles for Grant Morrison. And it's an idea I really like exploring because if we think about this, if we take about, if we take out all the woo-woo out of magic, if I told you to imagine a, you know, a pink elephant with sunglasses, in your mind, you're conjuring a pink elephant with sunglasses. That's simply taking the concept of magic to its logical, scientific, rational conclusion. Um, and if we think about it, how many times has a story really impacted us, made us feel sad? How many times have we felt uh, patriotic, proud of our national flag and hatred towards the flag of an enemy nation? Um, how many times has a work, uh, a manifesto, a book changed how human civilization has changed its philosophical or political views? How many times has a book changed how we felt uh, about the world and thus rewritten many laws? Um, how many times has a show bonded us together? Like, again, we are fans of My Little Pony. We are all here because a literal art of magic that Lauren Fouts created with her um, with her um, G4 My Little Pony essentially acted as a spell that united us and attracted us all here together. It's, it's something that uh, is powerful. And uh, what people like Alan Moore and Grant Morrison are saying now is um, uh, we artists and um, partakers of art really fail to realize the power that we artists and writers have in the world and that the only true quote unquote magicians that are really using their powers are the advertisers, the promoters, uh, the people who make the commercials and the ads, and thus it's really the advertisers who are really using magic to its fullest extent to attract people to buy their product and consume over and over again. And we need to take the power. We have to realize that us, the little guys, also have the same power. Um, so let's go back to where we left off yesterday so if you guys uh were in the panel i did with fiora yesterday the um where we were talking about the history of fan fiction uh let me let me go back and cover it a little bit in more detail from this angle again so we've had the concept of fan fiction being intertwined with storytelling. So like I said, when a shaman retells the story over and over again, this is essentially a fan fiction, a headcanon, because of how stories were recorded back then. Each time a story is retold, it would be slightly re reworked, slightly mutated, slightly shifted in a new way which each retelling. And really, since the uh, beginning of storytelling, We've had a lot of different ways of how these stories were told. So, um, for example, I love the Disney movie Hercules. Um, a lot of quote unquote fans of traditional Greek mythology did not like Disney Hercules because they didn't see it as adhering to Greek mythology canon. Well, I'm sorry to say that 
Greek mythology doesn't really have a true canon. In fact, most of the stories that we are looking at today within uh, Greek mythology are essentially fan fictions of fan fictions of fan fictions of the original Greek myths that we uh, that were told. In fact, we probably don't have any recordings of a lot of these original Greek myths. And, and we could see with works like Jason and the Argonauts that Fan fiction tropes like the like the idea of the crossover fan fiction has been really really common, um, where you take different heroes and gods from different myths and tie them together. Um, like I said, Journey to the West, the first uh, novel, one of the first novels in the modern world, um, took uh, Buddhist and Taoist gods and combined them into a story. So essentially, a crossover fan fiction between the gods of two different religions. Um, Within a year of Don Quixote, the first Western novel being published, a fan fiction to Don Quixote was written. So the idea of someone taking a story and retelling it um, has always been around. It's, it's nothing new. So the concept that fan fiction is something that really starts with modern fandom is not really true. Because fan fictions have been told since the beginning alongside stories being told. Now, um... I, I study genetic evolution at Johns Hopkins University, so I like looking at the idea of stories evolving as if I was looking at the concept of how um, uh, organisms evolved over time. And uh, this is something that I think has been pointed out by different literary professors. Harold Bloom, a, a Yale uh, literary professor, talks about his idea of the anxiety of influence in which he talks about how when you look at the realm of English poetry, every time you see a new branch of English poetry, it's normally because the student misinterprets the work of the master that came before and creates their own new type of style of poetry. And um, if we look at that in the evolutionary sense, that is what we call the mutation. Um, when we uh, so each time a DNA uh, uh, information is passed uh, to the offspring, the DNA is encoded. That's the storage of information, the transfer of information. And sometimes the DNA is not completely coded correctly, and thus you have some new slight mutation in the new form. If that mutation is successful, it goes on to eventually create a new organism after many many. Um, generations of replication. If it doesn't, it dies off. So if we think about this concept of evolution of in biological organisms, reproduction, the transfer of uh, information from one generation to the next, the concept of mutation, the concept of um, reproduction, and then dying off if the reproduction isn't successful, um, we could think about stories itself. Stories are living. Uh, franchises are living. Um, they are just as living as these biological organisms that we like to study. And we can see this happen a lot with people who look at previous stories that became before, maybe had their own unique headcanons of um, these uh, stories, and thus basically created their own line of stories that came before. So a good example I like to use is how when uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was a kid, he liked to read the works of Shakespeare, and he completely misinterpreted a lot of Shakespeare's uh, stories. Um, and when he realized that Shakespeare wasn't uh, talking about literal trees marching and the prophecy of the Macbeth didn't have a woman um, killing Macbeth, he was like, well, why don't I just make my story based on these quote-unquote headcanons that I had? And thus, uh, Tolkien went on to create the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings uh, series, kind of based off his own headcanons he had of Shakespeare works that came before. And we see this how um, how a lot of different authors um, look at the works of authors that came before and essentially do their own fan fiction of it. So you guys might um, uh, see that famous uh, meme that came from a webcomic of uh, Jules Verne being a fanboy of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. In fact, uh, Jules Verne wrote so many fan fictions of Edgar Allan Poe's stories. So um, Edgar Allan Poe wrote about, uh, you know, uh, flying to the moon. Jules Verne wrote a story about going to the moon. Um, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about a, uh, a hot air balloon adventure. Jules Verne wrote a story about a hot air balloon adventure. Um, in fact, it, it, you could see this really evident in um, 
Jules Verne's uh, novel, The Ice Sphinx, which is essentially his fan fiction, uh, I think using the exact same characters and storyline of Edgar Allan Poe's story, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, and creating his own continuation of the story that uh, came along with that. And um, The Mountains of Madness, H.P.'s Lovecraft story, was also in a sense, a fan fiction of the Jules Verne story. And of course, we see many, many creators working within the works of Lovecraft, the Cthulhu mythos, and creating their own uh, stories. And we can see that each of these individuals is kind of the fodder of their own branch of a specific uh, type of storytelling. Um, H.P. Lovecraft, of course, the father of cosmic horror. Jules Verne's one of the uh, fathers of science fiction and... Um, and uh, Edgar Allan Poe, the father of the detective uh, fiction, the mystery fiction, and one of the forerunners of science fiction. So we need this concept of being able to kind of retell stories over and over again that the modern day copyrights kind of deny us, which is why I think it is important that fan communities like uh, the, the community that we're in right now, the My Little Pony community, that's why I think it's important that we have a a really diverse uh, range of content creators, fanfic art uh, authors, and uh, artists. Um, so let's go look at where we kind of talk about where Madden fandom started. So before the advent of the printing press, um, most stories and arts were kind of reserved for the upper class because it was only the rich kings who could commission uh, handwritten books, uh, could commission these fan uh, these amazing paintings. It was only the upper class who could really afford to attend operas. Of course, in some cases like Shakespeare, he specifically made class um, stories for uh, the lower and middle classes. But for the most part, a lot of art and stories were reserved for the higher upper class. And such most stories up until this point of time were aimed with kings and aristocrats and nobles in mind. It wasn't really until uh, Alan Moore would argue Jane Austen started writing for the middle class that we really had the boom of what's now known as pop culture because now that she's writing for a middle class audience now the middle class could identify with these characters being written about um and we did start to see this uh this boom um with the industrial revolution printing became cheaper we started having pulp magazines zines comic books comic strips and uh really the first fandoms exploded uh, around the scene uh, specifically fans of sherlock holmes who would basically join the first fan clubs fan meetups in fact the earliest form of fan communication were probably through the fan mailing list where fans would debate and argue with each other um in the, in the mail, uh, sending letters to each other. These letters would be printed in fanzines that would also print fan fiction stories and headcanons. So, um, with the advent of technology and these authors and artists writing for lower middle classes, you start to see what's the birth of what's now known as pop culture, popular culture, culture for the masses. And as... Um, as access to printing became cheaper for the people, people started to produce their own fan stuff. So, for example, you might know of something called Tijuana Bibles, which were short, low 8 to 10 page comics, which took popular actors like Humphrey Bogart or characters like Flash Gordon or cartoon characters like Popeye and do their own little uh, fan comic of them. And most of these fan comics were. 90% of them were not safe for work adult smut. So a lot of people think, you know, like smut fiction and not safe for work adult fiction is a modern thing. No, no. As the instant we had access to produce our own comics, 90% of them were. And we kind of see this tradition continue um, with the fanzines. Um, specifically the Star Trek fandom with their fanzines popularized the concept of what we now know as slash fiction or shipping fiction where they would take two characters within the show um, who canonically were not romantically involved with each other but have them romantically involved within their own fan art and fan stories. Um, a lot of the time these are same-sex characters so it was an er early exploration of um, LGBT and gay relationship within fiction. Um, and this con idea of doing short little comics 
continued to Japan where the Dondinchi tradition really popped up. In fact, you could argue that the modern idea of the artist alley and anime cons evolved from these early Dondinchi artists um, getting little tables together um, in hotels and selling their little, uh, again, most of these were smut uh, yaoi shipping comics um, to their fans. Um, so this is a tradition that has been um, going on it's not a modern tradition. It's as long as it's happened. So, so what happened? Because people could make their own Star Trek comics. And in fact, Gene Roddenberry would say, "Oh, he loved. Uh, he would read someone's Star Trek fan fiction and say he loved the Star Trek fan fiction, and even say that he would share his, the fan fiction with uh, the cast and crew um, of the show." So, what really happened? Well, copyright law was a big factor in a lot of this. And for the most part, copyright law, you kind of get away with it uh, for the most part. Of course, you have parody magazines like uh, Mad Magazine doing parodies of these works, but you also had people doing unauthorized, you know, publications of their own comics of Superman or their own Sherlock Holmes stories. So what really happened? Well, there was a group of um, underground comic artists who really wanted to poke the hornet's has nest and do their own adult take on Mickey Mouse, where they saw Mickey Mouse was a symbol of American capitalism and uh, just American excess, uh, a, fam a wholesome family-friendly character. They had Mickey Mouse and Minnie, you know, engaging in lewd acts, engaging in sex, uh, running dope and drugs across the border. And um, uh, through some happenstance, this, of course, got the attention of Walt Disney Company, and they took them to court. Um, the uh, group known as the Ear Pipes would argue that their work was a satire that was a political commentary because artists, they, they saw themselves, of course, as artists. Artists were meant to comment on what's big and popular at the time. Of course, nothing was really bigger than Mickey Mouse during this time period. And they would argue that, of course, it was in their right as artists to do their own political commentary on Mickey Mouse. Disney would argue that because the general public would not be able to distinguish the difference between their comics and their official comics, that any mother or kid might accidentally pick up one of the Air Pirates comics and mistake it for an official comic, and then see Mickey and Donald engaging in, you know, lewd sex, it would scar these kids and the parents would sue Disney. So to protect their IP, their identity, their characters, they, they really, um... A twist of the hand of the court to extend the Copyright Protection Act, which now it's kind of nicknamed the Mickey Mouse Copyright Protection Act because of how big a hand Disney had it in. And then after this point in time, the concept of fan fiction and doing your own take on these stories left the public mainstream because people were now afraid of being sued. So fan fiction and fan comics kind of went underground. Now, no, this is a chart that kind of looks at the different extensions of the Copyright Acts. Um, one of the arguments of the Copyright Acts is that it protects the creators. Um, I would argue it does not, and we don't need to look any further than the comic book industry with DC and Marvel. How the creators of Superman, how Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, who basically created the entire Marvel um, universe and the the Marvel franchise that's making in billions now, they these artists never really got the recognition they deserved for their creation and they were overshadowed by their own creations and a lot of them died poor and penniless um, with these corporations take raking in all the money um, that uh, of these characters and these artists being fairly undertreated and this is where Alan Moore steps in and really really defends um, the artists um, so We'll get a little bit into that later, but we could kind of quickly look over the factors of fair use. So it looks like because of that delay we had earlier, I'm going to try to breeze through the rest of this panel as fast as I can. But um, so I talk about transformative work and you could look at the factors of fair use. They're, they're not always equivalent with transformative, but a lot of the definitions do overlap. So if we look at some of the factors for fair use, we could compare them to different works of fan fiction. So for this next part, I want to talk about how modern fan fiction, I felt, 
Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of fan fiction historians out there that probably go into this more in depth than I did. I'm doing my own independent interpretation of this, so it might be right, it might be wrong, but my interpretation is because of all these fans being afraid of lawsuits from these companies, like you see a lot of conventions that used to be open to having uh, fan artists and fan fiction um, in the 70s being sold at their event, and then in the 80s, uh, they were excluded and blacklisted from these cons. So. These early fan fictions, like if we argue that Jules Verne's and Lovecraft were doing fan fictions of Edgar Allan Poe's work, you could say these fan fictions would have equal mainstream appeal because these were mass market publications, so they would reach a massive audience. Now that fan fiction kind of went more underground, became insular, I would say it became more niche. So because these are these writers knew they weren't appealing to a large crowd now they were right for their small group of friends so they would they would write to kind of justify head cannons or ships that they had and thus these stories would become less and less universal and more and more personal to the point that you started to see a lot of self-insert characters and of course this is around the time where we had the idea of the mary sue developed the mary sue is a term for, uh, it comes from one of the Star Trek uh, characters where there's a self-insert character called Mary Sue. So, you kind of see how these fandoms are driven underground, and I would argue that these stories were no longer trying to be creative and try to do as unique transformative takes as the previous uh, fanfiction writers that came before, because they know they weren't trying to make some grand magnum opus like Ulysses. They were just writing for a small group. So this is where we get the idea of fanfiction kind of being more, you know, unprofessional, amateurish in its writing. Um, of course, there are some cases where some fan fictions are able to make it to the mainstream. For example, Fifty Shades of Grey uh, started out as a Twilight fan fiction. Um, but yeah, this is where I'll argue um, that if we look at this, again, if we look at evolution, this is my own personal take, but if we look at evolution, the the mutation needs to have a wide a wide uh, appeal uh, to really become its own independent organism. So for example, if we just look at... Um, so my favorite works, I really love Mauro Oro and Bojack Horseman. I obviously thought Mauro Oro, um, which did what it did first, was really, really unique um, in how it told its stories and how it kind of tried to transform the television medium. But because uh, Mauro Oro um, really got little attention, I would say it kind of fell the way of the niche dead... Uh, genre it didn't really inspire as many people as it should have well bojack uh kind of did a lot of the same things more oral attempted but because it got mass appeal um you could see a lot of people now being inspired by the works of bojack and a lot of new adult animation kind of following this bojack route um so uh looks like i'm kind of running out of time so i'm just going to quickly go through some of these cases for factors of figure so the point of this is if you guys are creators out there to try to keep these things in mind, to try to avoid or do what's happening in a lot of these court cases, but there have been a few cases where fan fiction was published and it was taken to court, and the courts had to decide whether these fan fictions fall under fair use or were considered transformative or were not. So the first case I like to bring is a unauthorized sequel to Catcher in the Rye. Um, just to quickly summarize, it was not authorized it was not allowed to be published because it was simply just baking off the popularity and name of catch in the right it didn't add any substance to the work it didn't add any new critical commentary it didn't really do anything new and unique with its story the other way is you might think oh something that's educational could work right well we had the case with the harry potter lexicon which was encyclopedia of harry potter but in fringe on jk rowling's potential market if she wanted to make her own harry potter encyclopedia this fan work would would hurt that so the monetary market is another consideration then the next case is a cat not in the hat which was a parody of the cat in the hat but it retold this but it basically retold the story of the oj simpson murders but in the style of dr seuss now the you might think, okay, this should be allowed to pass, right? No, the problem is it's using so much of Dr. Seuss's iconic storytelling style and artwork, but doesn't offer any criticism or critique or commentary on Dr. Seuss. So if you're trying to emulate another artist or writer's style, 
if you are simply just emulating the style for and trying to adapt another story, that wouldn't fall under fair use or it wouldn't fall under transformative as well. Because if you are trying to emulate someone else's work, you have to also be kind of critiquing or doing a commentary on that piece or else there's no point of doing it in that style, again, other than to be more marketable. Uh, the Last Ring Bearer is another example with Lord of the Rings, I would argue, which falls more in the transformative clause. But the one that did actually get passed in the courts and was allowed to be published is The Wind Done Gone. The Wind Done Gone is a retelling of Gone with the Wind, but from the perspective of the uh, black um, slave in the story. Um, the fact that black female slaves were considered probably the lowest um, class um, in... Um, in the Civil War South, in the uh, antebellum South, um, Gone with the Wind is a story written for middle class white people, white southerners. So, of course, this background character would hardly be important in the original Gone with the Wind story. Now, if you, you when you retell the story from this perspective of a black female slave, it completely changes the dynamic of the Gone with the Wind story. It adds a new layer of uh, political commentary, a new layer of social commentary, a new layer of racial commentary. Again, it's bringing in that um, idea of being a kind of, you know, bringing up disturbing messages, like what Michael Moorcock was talking about with his subversive message, bringing things up front to try to address. Because When Done Gone addressed um, the issues with Gone to Win and add a new layer of commentary, it's now considered its own unique transformative piece and it was thus allowed to be um, published. Now, it was published under the idea, it was called, it had to have a sticker that says unauthorized parody, and that gets into the issue of what's parody, what's satire. Um, in most cases, most people will say parody, you know, makes fun of a genre, but it's kind of a love letter to a genre. It works within the world of that genre. While it might point out the uh, the flaws and tropes, like for example, One Punch Man, it might point these issues out. It still very much loves and tries to sustain these stories. On the other hand, satire is normally more critical and it uses the work as a critical message. So if we look at the example of Alan Moore and Grant Morrison, you can see this divide. Alan Moore thinks superheroes are dangerous. He thinks superhero, the superhero genre is a wish fulfillment fantasy that blinds us to the realities of the world. It, it, uh, again, he's someone who was heavily influenced by Michael Moorcock, who's also his friend. He would say superheroes kind of make us, superheroes are really meant uh, to placate uh, childhood wish fulfillment fantasy and has no role in adulthood. In fact, he would say it stunts uh, mental growth and would argue that, you know, the first b true American blockbuster, uh, Mass Avengers blockbuster, was Birth of the Nation with the Klansmen and would say that uh, we Americans kind of fall under this fascist notion of superheroes, which is a critique that's now being addressed to the uh, MCU and Avengers franchises. And would he would point out that the year that uh, Donald Trump won and Brexit happened was also a year that it was the superhero movies that were dominating the blockbusters. So he would say it's kind of a distraction from the world and his works like Watchmen was meant to end the superhero genre to make us say, hey, this is bad. Let's try to move beyond this and not try to escape to superheroes whenever we have problems. Grant Morrison, on the other hand, sees superheroes as inherently good. They are good to have morals. Well, Alan Moore would say superheroes have a really simplistic black and white good uh, and evil view of morality. Grant Morrison would argue that no, this, this sense of morality, right and wrong, is ingrained with us because it's what leads to our survival as, uh, as a human species. And that these superheroes are ethereal sources pulled out of the ether that are meant to be role models for us, for us to emulate so that we could someday become superheroes and try to change the world. So he's more of the wish fulfillment side of this. Um, Alan Moore is famous for deconstruction where, um, uh, in fact, this goes to, I would say, uh, a hermetic uh, term, solve aquila, um, separate and rejoin, where Alan Moore, specifically in his work Watchmen, was deconstructing the superhero, and Grant Morrison was trying to justify it and put it back together again. And again, we see this within both their works, how Alan Moore really vilifies and critiques every notion of the superhero while Grant Morrison is trying to justify and show the heroic, good, positive sides of the superhero. Now, 
we looked at these different works of what were considered transformative. Now, I would argue if you look at modern day franchises, most of them wouldn't fall under the same transformative clause. If we put these modern franchises up to the same standards that these fan fictions had to be put through in the court, I would argue that most of these fan fiction, um, most of these fan fictions, I mean, most of these franchise works, these reboots, these sequels, um, these retcons would not fall under the same fair use factor. Um, like the modern day Star Trek and Star Wars, all this stuff is just aping on the uh, the franchise. So of course it's going to play safe. You have relatively few examples where a work is transformed in a sense that it becomes something completely new. Like Lauren Faust's reboot of My Little Pony would be transformative, but a lot of these blockbuster sequels and franchises, I would argue, were not. Um, and this is because Again, these these have to make money. So to make money, they have to appeal to the biggest market, which is why Force Awakens, a movie that played it very, very safe, it basically copied everything from um, uh, um, A New Hope, played it safe, didn't really try to step out of lines, it got very, very high audience and critic ratings. While Last Jedi, a film I personally love, but I know a lot of Star Wars fans hated because it changed everything about the Star Wars war so much. It was really unidentifiable to a lot of Star, war, uh, Star Wars fans as a Star Wars film. While it got high critic rating, it got really, really low audience um ratings. So this is an example of why companies try to play it safe. And because it plays it safe, I would argue kind of dumbs down a lot of these works that um, you they try to emulate what 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 made money so much it kind of uh, stifles these creativities. And um, so if we look at like we're saying stories influence stories that come later. But sometimes there is a character that becomes so influential, it spawns emulations, which spawns emulations, which spawns emulations, which spawns emulation. Now, Alan Moore and his protege, Grant Morrison, would argue that this is basically photocopying of a photocopy. That most American comic book stories are simply fanboys retelling their favorite Silver Age stories over and over and over again. And if you've seen Bojack Horseman where they talked about Xerax of a Xerax, these are photocopies of photocopies of photocopies of photocopies, which really degrade over time. Or if you're looking from my genetic biology perspective, it's basically inbreeding. And when you inbreed, you have some really, really ugly offsprings. Um, a good example is you had works like the Bickersons, which inspired the Honeymooners, which inspired Flintstones, which inspired Simpsons, which inspired Family Guy, which of course had its own um, series of emulation. And over time, again, created some very, very ugly offsprings, uh, and in a literal sense, very ugly. So I would argue that Alan Moore is not hypocritical. He sees art and storytelling from a higher perspective of what most mainstream people would, and that J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter is not really original in its sense, um, that everything from the secret platform that goes to a magical world, a uh, a glasses wearing boy wizard. Even the term muggle was created by the same author of the uh, writer of Larry Potter. And uh, even the term Harry Potter was actually a name that, that Alan Moore came up with first as the husband of Dorothy in his Lost Girl series. So, J.K. Rowling and a lot of these franchise people, so when Alan Moore complains about these um, these derivatives of Watchmen, he has a really, really big point. Even the most transformative of these, the Watch, the HBO Watchmen TV series, doesn't matter how great it was, how transformative it is, the fact that it's banking off the name Watchmen, that its title is simply Watchmen, shows that it cares more about markability than the artistic storytelling. Well, the, uh, cause the, uh, I'm sure the, the story is fantastic, but on the outside, it's really just trying to bank off the name Watchmen. And that's a problem. Most people don't understand the intricacies of Watchmen, and I don't have enough time to go through them, but there's a lot of artistic and narrative techniques that Watchmen pursue that its emulators fail to pick up on. Um, very few people. I think Grant Morrison is really the only person who understands Alan Moore, and his work was actually a take that, a his own criticism of Watchmen, which I would argue became transformative. And of course, you would have other takes um, on Watchmen that I would argue kind of steps in the right direction. 
But yeah, they all fall into one of these scales of derivative or transformative. This is all stuff I'm trying to cover in my own comic book series. I've been working on my own comic called The Medium uh, for like um, almost the last decade now. I hope to get the first issue out soon. But it deals with this stuff. This is stuff that I like talking about and I hope that as creators yourselves, you guys could kind of come... When you look at your own creations, whether you're doing fan art or your own original stories, try to look up these ideas of trying to make yourself not just escapist. Escapism is good. Escapism has its place. But also try to add a little stimulation, add a little transformation to your work. Try to create something new that could expand beyond um, what come before. Don't just try to aim for the mass market. Try to have a unique take that pushes the evolutionary tree of storytelling forward. Reclaim art as the true magic that it is. Don't let the magic of art fall into the hands of the advertisers and these franchise copyright holders. It really belongs to us, the critters and artists. Thank you very much for watching Transformative, and remember to shift your perspective.